All right, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce James Campbell. Uh, his resume includes writing for Outside Magazine, National Geographic, as well as Men's Journal. Um, his first book was entitled The Final Frontiersman, which actually tells the story of his cousin. Um, at the age of 20, his cousin moved to the Alaska Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and um, lived there for, is he still there? 30 years. 30 years, 30 years. yeah. 30 years. Um, well, during that time, he met a wife and they had two kids. He actually met his wife while walrus hunting. Uh, shows how life is different up there. Um, <laughs> It's amazing what you find on Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he currently resides in Wisconsin with his wife and three daughters. Uh, the reason he's here today is to talk about his most recent book called The Ghost Mountain Boys. Um, this book takes place in World War II. Uh, it tells the story of the 32nd Division who um, they were sent to New Guinea. Um, it's kind of a, um, it's a forgotten story. It, just, it hasn't gotten as much publicity as it deserves um, as opposed to some of the other World War II battles. Um, this was a very important battle because this was uh, an island that the Japan Japanese coveted um, for the strategic position. So with no further ado, James Campbell. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Um, well, the publicity thing, I guess we're taking care of that today. <laughs> Is this called a podcast? I don't even know. <laughs> I was just explaining that I'm kind of a Luddite, so all the technology is a bit overwhelming. But first of all, thank you to Michael. Michael was the inspiration behind this. I spoke in Grand Rapids, and Michael's uh, grandfather is um, one of the heroes of the 32nd Division. So he, he's very, very close to the story. And it is a forgotten story. Before I go on, though, I should thank Samira not only for arranging this, but for working out all the details and to Google for for hosting this. I think it's a great thing. Um, you know, I wish more companies across the United States would do that. We could actually, you know, perhaps make money as writers. <laughs> I've, I've chosen to support my family this way, although sometimes I wonder why. But um, the book is called, the full title of the book is called The Ghost Mountain Boys, Their Epic March and the Terrifying Battle for New Guinea, the Forgotten War of the South Pacific. Uh, long subtitles are all the rage these days, so I even have to stare at the book cover to remember it. But um, I, the book for me, writing the book was both um, a profoundly emotional experience and also a labor of love. I interviewed over 60 veterans of the campaign. I had to track them down all across the United States. I interviewed many of their family members and also their friends, and I made two trips to New Guinea. So I worked very, very hard to, to, to get at the story, and I hope it shows. I, 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 hope, I hope people find that it's a moving book. Uh, I guess ultimately you guys will be the judges of that. But as Michael said, this is my second book. I wrote for magazines for 15 years, primarily doing um, environmental writing and um, I, I guess adventure or ecotourism. And uh, my first book was called The Final Frontiersman, as Michael said, and it is about my cousin. Uh, a young man from Wisconsin who went up to Alaska in the early 70s as part of the coming into the country experience. You might be familiar with John McPhee's book, Coming Into the Country. But he went up there, except he, he, he didn't go to Fairbanks, he didn't go to work on the pipeline. He went to what is now the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. He went 120 miles above the Arctic Circle and 100 miles from his nearest neighbor. Uh, settled there, raised, raised three daughters there, and essentially the book is about the joys and tragedies of their lives. And um, I worked very, very hard to get at that story, too. I made six trips to the Arctic over two years. Each trip lasted about two months. I lived in a tent at 40 below. I hunted and trapped with this family. And I logged over 600 miles on foot and snowshoe across, across the Arctic. In fact, my first trip was a 40-day unsupported backpacking trip through the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, fortunately, we were able to catch a lot of fish. I don't know what we would have done had we not been able to do that. But when I was done with that book, I swore to myself and my wife that my next book I was going to do something easy. In fact, my first, uh, my first book um, uh, proposal to my agent in New York was I was going to do a beer tour of the United States. And I was going to call it Travels with Barley and take off on John Steinbeck's book. And unfortunately, the book never got, never got off the ground. So instead of doing that, I chose to do this story, a book set on the island in New Guinea, uh, from, I guess, from the absurd to the sublime. But um, 
this book, as I said, I, did, I worked very hard to, to get at too. I don't know what you know about New Guinea, but when I, when I was a magazine writer, I traveled all over the world. And New Guinea is the most rugged place I've ever been in my entire life. Uh, MacArthur's chief engineering officer called it the ultimate nightmare country and he said that the U.S. Army would encounter challenges without precedence on, in U.S. military history on the island of New Guinea. And mind you, this was after the tragedy of Bataan, so Bataan, the Bataan Peninsula of the Philippines is one of the most rugged places in the world, and so he was comparing uh, New Guinea with Bataan. It's also, New Guinea is also a disease-ridden land. Seventy percent of the men who fought there came down with either, either dengue fever or malaria or both and a host of other tropical ailments. Um, the, the, the book, my book, is specifically about 1,100 men who made one of the cruelest marches in military history across the Papuan Peninsula of New Guinea. And I'm not sure if people know what the, what New, where New Guinea is. It's a big island, second largest island in the world. It sits just above Australia and shaped like a prehistoric bird in the tail that hangs down just above Australia is called the Papuan Peninsula. And they marched 130 miles as a crow flies through fetid swamps and dense jungles and over unmapped mountains, which are today unmapped. And it took them 42 days, and when they reached the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula, they were physically shattered by the experience. Men lost a third of their body weight on the trek. They started out at 180 pounds, they ended up at 120 pounds, and they went directly into battle against the Japanese Imperial Army. And Michael's, Michael's grandfather was one of those men who, who, made, who made that march. And so I, I guess what I should, I should forewarn you, the book is not for the faint of heart. It is a brutal book, but it was a brutal war fought under really brutal conditions. But the point I always try to make is, you know, men like your grandfather, they were not brutal men. They were the archetype of citizen soldiers. They were men who left behind girlfriends and mothers and young families and young wives. And certainly the last place in the world they wanted to be was the island of New Guinea. And far too many of them died there and obviously obviously never never made it home. But what I've what I've tried to do is not really not write a military history and not write so much a, a, a war story. What I've tried to do is write uh, what I hope, and I hope I've succeeded, a deeply personal soldier's story. And to do that, as I said, I interviewed 60 veterans, and I interspersed the book with their first-hand accounts, their recollections, their anecdotes, uh, their lots of diary entries, and also, also their letters. In fact, I begin the book with the love letters of a division surgeon from Grand Rapids, Michigan, to his wife back home, and uh, his name was Major uh, Major Simon Warmanhoven, and he was a bit of a poet. And there's a there's a real purity to his letters, but I I include those letters because I, I think they very beautifully and painfully express the heartache and the longing that all those soldiers must have felt. Not only the soldiers who were fighting in New Guinea, but all the other soldiers who fought in World War II and fought in all the later battles and are fighting today in in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, that said, uh, the very long preliminary. Um, what I thought I'd do is just try to quickly trace the, the narrative of the book for you, and then um, show you this. We're, uh, we're working on a documentary film. I, I started a documentary film company, and um, we, in 2006, I, we made an expedition to New Guinea to retrace the route of the Ghost Mountain Boys. We shot 40 hours of footage. Footage was only the second time in history that anybody had walked across New Guinea's Papuan Peninsula, with these guys being the first. So it was a historical achievement in its own right. In fact, the New Guinea government called it the most significant feat of exploration since 1975. And we, un we encountered um, uh, unmapped mountains. We couldn't find maps for about 50 miles of the track. And then I thought I'd just talk briefly about my own experiences in New Guinea. I've made six trips to New Guinea, the first one back in 1989. But um, the Ghost Mountain Boys were part of the 32nd Infantry Division, which prior to World War II was a loosely organized National Guard unit made up mostly of men from Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, the National Guard was federalized in October of 1940, 
and these men had their service extended beyond one year. They'd entered the Guard, uh, National Guard with the assumption that they'd be in for just one year. Well, none of them were too happy that they that their that uh, had that term had been extended. And at that time, they were loaded onto trains across the Midwest. There were big celebrations, and they were sent to the Deep South, where they began their training, which in the, which within the context of the war in New Guinea, was both inadequate and absolutely irrelevant. Um, at a place called Camp Beauregard, which the soldiers referred to with, I guess, kind of. Uh, GI black humor as camp disregard. They trained with broom handles for guns and sticks for bayonets. Um, that summer they participated in something called the Louisiana Maneuvers, which were the largest peacetime war games in U.S. history. 400,000 soldiers staged mock battles in East Texas and Louisiana. But for these soldiers of the 32nd Division, that training would have no practical application for what they would encounter in New Guinea. They learned no jungle survival skills, and they learned no jungle combat skills. In fact, one of the heroes of my book wrote 40 years later in his memoirs, he said that uh, the swamps of Louisiana were so available, but we did not train in them, had we only known. About two months after Pearl Harbor, they were again loaded onto trains and sent to a place called Fort Devens, Massachusetts. They thought that would be their last stop before being sent over to Europe. But they got new marching orders there, were again loaded onto trains and sent clear across the country to San Francisco. Um, and on April 19, 1942, they set sail for Australia. Uh, they landed in Adelaide, Australia. Three weeks later, after a miserable journey, most of these men had never been at sea, and they were sick by the hundreds. And um, about three months after they arrived in Australia, the Japanese Imperial Army invaded the island of New Guinea. And MacArthur, who was um, the commanding general of the Southwest Pacific, was beside himself because he had just unveiled a plan to, to seize the very land that the Japanese had just invaded. Uh, nevertheless, he uh, and his staff insisted that the Japanese would never attempt to capture a place called Port Moresby, which was, the U, which was an allied base on the island of New Guinea. But that's not only what the Japanese intended to do, that's exactly what they did do. In about seven weeks after they landed on the island of New Guinea, they walked over the Owen Stanley Mountains, which MacArthur thought, were, thought the mountains were so formidable that the Japanese would never be able to do it. They reached a place called Yorubaya Ridge, and they were 30 miles short of the Allied base at Port Moresby. And at that point, MacArthur scrambled to mobilize these guys, the 32nd Division. By this time, the 32nd Division had made it to a place called Brisbane, Australia, at a camp called Camp Tambourine. Um, they, they got there and they thought they'd immediately begin their jungle training and their jungle combat skills, but they realized when they got there that they had to build this camp from scratch. So when they should have been preparing to fight the Japanese, they were literally digging the trains and erecting tents, and also patrolling the beaches outside of Brisbane, Australia. Nevertheless, MacArthur mobilized a military historians called th these guys the guinea pigs of the South Pacific with good reason. They were being sent, they were being sent to New Guinea, one of the most malarial places in the world. They were being sent there without insect propellant. They were being sent there in many cases without anything to treat malaria. They had World War I wool leggings and they were just horribly ill-equipped and untrained. Uh, the first group arrived on New Guinea on September 15th, and one of the heroes of my, my book from Big Rapids, Michigan, wrote in his diary, September 15th, 5.30 p.m., temperature 115 degrees, New Guinea weather is hotter than the lower story of hell. The next group that was sent over immediate, arrived and immediately began to blaze a trail off, across the mountains of New Guinea from the south coast of the Papuan Peninsula to the north coast where the Japanese were entrenched. And uh, <coughs> 17 days out, the, the man who led this group over the mountains radioed back to the division command post that the trail that he had just blazed was taxing but practicable. 
And with that message, he set in, in motion what can only be described as MacArthur's lunatic plan. MacArthur intended to send over 10,000 soldiers, or at the very least, 1,000 soldiers over some of the most forbidding topography on, as I said, on the planet Earth. Um, and, the, and, well, he, the, the Australians tried to talk him out of it. Papua had been an Australian colony since 1906. The Australians knew what they were talking about. They said the terrain was too rough, the mountain pass is too high, the rivers were too fast, and the mountain tribes were unpredictable. But any, anybody who knows anything about MacArthur, and I don't know if you do, but he was the supreme egotist. And he could not be dissuaded from his plan. In fact, he dismissed some of the Australian generals very curtly. You know, how, how dare you tell me, General MacArthur, what to do. Um, so he, he began sending men over. The next group to go was a group called the Meetendorp Patrol, which was led by a guy named Alfred Meetendorp from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, their job was to set up drop sites along this route. The planes would drop food and medicine, whatever else, and they would collect it. About three days in, he wrote in his diary that New Guinea was nature gone mad. The next group to go was 800 soldiers um, from a regiment of the 32nd Infantry Division. And they began about a month into the rainy season. And I, I don't know what you know about New Guinea again, but we all think of Seattle as the rainiest city in the United States. Seattle gets between 40 inches and 60 inches of rain a year. The Papuan Peninsula of New Guinea gets between two and 300 inches of rain a year. So these men set out and they were walking on a muddy trail, which was nothing more than than a, a deer trail through the woods. It was a native hunting and trading trail. And you can imagine what 1,600 boots would do to a muddy trail. They were walking in mud up to their shins. About two days in, they were walking in mud up to their knees. And the mud would suck at their boots, so they'd grab their legs, and they'd have to yank their legs out of, their, out of the mud, and that's how they walked. And even for 18, 19, 20-year-old men who are virtually indestructible, this was absolutely excruciating. About a week in, malaria hit. They've been exposed to malaria on the coast, and now the parasites were reproducing inside their livers and bursting into their bloodstreams. And um, they had, they had, they'd been given quinine which is what they used at that time to lessen the effects of malaria. It didn't prevent it, it merely mitigated it. And however, they were given no waterproof containers when they started out. So they take the quinine, they put it in their pockets, and you can imagine what happened to this stuff in the jungle. It would, they'd stick it in their pocket, it would crumble and dissolve. So they had nothing to, to um, take the edge off malaria. So they were walking with 102, 103, 104 degree fevers. And I don't know, when I, when I get a 102 degree, degree, degree fever, I'm an absolute wimp. wimp. I, don't want to, I don't want to get out of these bed. And these men were walking over eight, nine, ten foot, 10,000 foot mountains. And in New Guinea, it's unlike Colorado. You, you get in Colorado, you get up to 10,000 feet, and sometimes you can walk 40, 50 miles uh, farther than that in some cases. But in New Guinea, you get up to 9,000 feet, you're up there for 10 feet, and then you walk straight down, and then you walk straight back up and straight back down. So it was absolutely excruciating for these men. Then about a week later, dysentery hit. They'd been eating this stuff called bully beef, which they loathed. It was canned mutton from Australia, and it came in five pound tins, and they'd open this stuff in the jungle. And you can imagine what happened to it. It quickly spoiled, but they were, they were hungry, and many of them starving, so they ate this stuff. And then, and that's when the suffering really began. And men, again, who were in the prime of their lives were collapsed alongside the trail and pleaded with their buddies to, to leave them there to die. And they, they could, they, they, the, the jungle had defeated them physically and then had, had destroyed their willpower. But of course their friends didn't leave them there. They picked them up. They also had 400 native carriers, Papua New Guinean carriers, and by the way, the Papua New Guineans have never, ever been given enough credit for their role in this war. And they, so the, the men who could no longer walk were carried along by their buddies, and eventually everybody kept moving. But as they did, they started tossing stuff out of their field packs. And they, th they threw out everything they possibly could. They threw out underwear and socks and mess kits and raincoats and helmets and sweaters 
and shelter halves, which are virtually like a tent. They threw out shovels, everything they thought was expendable, but what they, even, even ammunition in many cases, but what they didn't realize is that when they were in the jungles, it was 100 degrees and 100% humidity. They'd get up to eight or 9,000 feet into the swirling clouds of ice and rain where it's 25, 30 degrees, and they'd nearly freeze to death. So uh, one of the guys in my book described that hike as one green hell. And I'll just read just a very quick paragraph from his diary because I think it really expresses just how horrible that was. And he's actually a guy out of Big Rapids. You can hardly realize how wild and ghost-like this mountain country is, almost perpetual rain and steam. We have been traveling over an almost impassable trail. Our strength is gone. Most of us have dysentery. Boys are falling out and dropping back with fever, continuous downpour of rain. Bully beef makes us sick. We seem to climb straight up for hours, then down again. God, will it never end? Well, eventually it did end, as I said, it ended 42 days later when they finally reached the north coast. And when they finally reached the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula, they realized that their, that their journey had been in vain because MacArthur had discovered usable airfields on the north coast of New Guinea's Papuan Peninsula and had flown over 8,000 men. So nobody else had to make this terrible trek. Um, Nevertheless, as I mentioned, they were physically shattered by the experience. Amazingly, only three men died on the hike. One was, two of them were swept away by the river, and one of them just collapsed from exhaustion. One of the, one of the commanders had a heart attack. But the, people ask me, how is that possible? And I, I say, well, again, as I said before, that 18, 19, 20-year-old men are virtually indestructible, except in the face of bullets. Um, and, and these were as a, young men who, who had been hardened by the Depression, who were not strangers to, to, um, to, to very, very hard physical work. Nevertheless, they were sent, they were sent directly into battle, uh, into battle without the weaponry to take out the Japanese bunkers. The Japanese had been here for three months uh, up and down this 11-mile front. They built hundreds and hundreds of reinforced bunkers, and the, and the American soldiers, the 32nd Division, had nothing to take them out. So they used what one of my one of the characters in my book called Civil War Tactics, which amounted to nothing more than individual acts of heroism. They'd rush these bunkers, and they'd just be they'd be cut down, and um, far too many people died that way. Um, they also the Japanese also commanded all the high ground, and um, uh, on the high ground, they cut these firing lanes, and these men were green. They'd never, they'd never been in combat before. They n had no idea what a firing lane, firing lane was, so they were walking in swamps. Mind you, swamps filled with crocodiles and long, and long, um, and, and uh, swamp rats. And they were walking into swamps, waist deep, um, tidal swamps. So when the tide came in, it was chest deep. So they'd see this high ground, these firing lanes. They'd think, Hallelujah, I can get out of here. So they'd go to the firing lanes, walk, climb out of the swamps and walk on these firing lanes only to be cut down by Japanese machine gunners. And that's when they fled back into the swamps and that's where they lived and fought and far too many of them died. Um, the, the battle was extremely costly. It, uh, it was a two month long battle. It's described as one of the most savage battles of the entire South Pacific. Eventually the 32nd Division did defeat the Japanese in what the U.S. Army calls the first major victory of um, the land war in the South Pacific. In fact, the 65th anniversary, maybe your grandfather told you, of that victory is um, January 22nd. So what is that next, is that next Tuesday or something like that? Um, so it's, um, it, it is a forgotten, unrecognized story. Um, I hope that this book has changed some of that, and I hope that this film will change some of that also. So I think what we'll do, so you don't, so we can have a little break from my talking, is watch this, is watch this DVD. As I said, we, sh we, we walked across New Guinea last summer, uh, I and a small expedition team. You'll see that it didn't exactly go as planned. On the first day, I was carrying a 70-pound pack and I fell 20 feet down the mountain and I tore the anterior cruciate ligament in my right knee and I eventually, I, I walked out 
went back to Port Moresby, got painkillers and anti-inflammatories, and then we were helicoptered back out, and then we continued our journey. And I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that after this. But this, uh, one other thing, um, we're now in the process of selling this to either PBS or History Channel. Abuna Begano, Radio Eguni, Begano, Radio Ewa. Are you projecting it so we can see it on the same too? Abuna Begano, Radio Eguni. It should be projecting. It's not? No, it's not. So. Do you see it now? Oh. Oh. We have both of the projectors turned on. Do you have the yellow cable? Yeah, try to yellow is for the PCs Technology. I'm pushing the yellow button to present or turning it off the video. We're going to try another cable. Okay. Let's see if that works. I know I don't think it has it. That just controls um, our cables in here. Yeah. I'll try anything. <coughs> Did you push the presentation button? Yeah. On your remote? Can you see it now? No. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. You want to start it Thanks. again? Or? Okay, we're going to start it again. Yeah. Does anyone know how to full screen right there? All time to it. In a journey that strained the limits of endurance, James Campbell has rediscovered a nearly forgotten chapter of World War II bravery and suffering. In 2006, the author and adventurer began an extraordinary quest to retrace the path of an American infantry battalion sent on an impossible mission. The soldiers were ordered to march 120 miles over the uncharted mountains of New Guinea. Their journey has been described as one of the cruelest in modern military history. Many of them National Guardsmen from the Midwest, they would endure an incredible test of survival before they even entered combat. Starting from their coastal camp, the soldiers slashed their way through the jungle to a 9,000-foot peak that the natives said was haunted. The soldiers called it Ghost Mountain, and they would become known as the Ghost Mountain Boys. Well, Ghost Mountain, we walked over to Ghost Mountain. There wasn't a bug, a fly, or nothing. No, no birds, it was just weird, it was eerie. As we went along, and of course the more burdens had been gotten, the tired you got, well, you start shedding stuff. And I think when we went over to Ghost Mountain, when I shed everything I had. And those natives would go over it because I think they had, uh, they, they couldn't go but just so far. Malaria, dysentery, jungle rot, trench foots, and hunger plagued them. And on the other side of the mountains, elite troops of the Japanese Empire waited in their bunkers. The battles on the beaches and in the swamps of New Guinea, sometimes fought hand to hand, were some of the most savage of the South Pacific War. That was 1942. More than a half century later, Campbell began assembling his Ghost Mountain team. Old friend and Chicago-based journalist George Hood agreed to take part, suggesting they collaborate on a documentary. Another friend, Dave Musgrave, 
professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and an accomplished backpacker also signed on. I can't imagine doing this. Not knowing what's ahead, having dysentery, malaria, not having the right equipment. Outside magazine photographer Philip Engelhorn became the team's fourth member. Can I go home now? German by birth, Engelhorn was based in Hong Kong. I'm tired and I'm hungry. Palm Productions of New Guinea provided a camera crew. The trail boss was Lee Ticehurst, an Australian living in New Guinea and an experienced jungle trekker. Slingshots and spears and the dogs. The dogs are more important than anything else that you can hunt with. These dogs will not bark until they see the game. And then everybody knows it's on. On a hot June day from a high ridge overlooking the Mimoni River, Campbell and his team began their journey. At first day, the expedition nearly collapsed when Campbell fell and re-injured a knee. He was forced to turn back. Tired and dehydrated, Hood also retreated. We're feeling pretty exhausted. It's a tortuous country. Um, I'm 44 years old with a bad wheel. I uh, thought I could do it, and um, it's a killer. We get three days in, we start failing, then what the heck do we do? Plus, we didn't want to slow down the entire group. Rather humiliating, as you might imagine. The rest of the team went on. Back in Port Moresby, Campbell and Hood regrouped. Four days later, they rejoined the team by helicopter, landing at a village called La Rooney. The team did not travel alone. team hired carriers and guides from the villages along the route. Among them was Beirua. As a seven-year-old boy, too frightened to stay behind, Beirua followed his parents as they carried ammunition and supplies for the Americans. Now more than 70, he and his wife Bima would help guide Campbell and his team over Ghost Mountain. Beirua warned Campbell the mountain was haunted by Masalai, evil spirits and demons. Barua told other stories and helped the team find those who knew or remembered the American soldiers. They saw the plane press, and then they, they start, the troops were moving, the American troops will start moving down to where the plane press. Those tales have become part of the local folklore passed down from generation to generation around village campfires. In 1942, the rugged interior of New Guinea was an unmapped wilderness. Sixty-four years later, the team would discover an ecosystem and native people largely unchanged by the passage of time. remains a land of no roads and long forgotten villages where hunters still use slingshots and spears and have little contacts with the outside world. After more than a month of suffering, the men of the Ghost Mountain Battalion reached the north coast of New Guinea. They went directly into battle, joined by the rest of their 32nd Infantry Division comrades. According to one historian, the combat was a knife fight out of the Stone Age. Though not on a military mission, Campbell's team pushed across New Guinea toward an important goal, 
to resurrect the story of the Ghost Mountain Boys. It became an ordeal the team could not have imagined, and one it will never forget. God knows I could, could not have done it. Um, anyway, I guess I'll make just a few remarks about, or try to make just a few remarks about my own experiences. In New Guinea, um, pe people always ask me how I came. First of all, what, what spurred my interest in New Guinea and how I came to write the story and or discover it. Um, I first went to New Guinea in 1989. I was working in Chicago at the time, and my brother had just graduated from college, and we grew up on National Geographic specials, and we always imagined going to Borneo and going to the Amazon jungle and going to Africa. But New Guinea um, was the place that fascinated us more than any place in the world. So he called me up and he said, now's, now's the time for an adventure. And I said, you're right. So um, I put in, uh, I was working at an ad agency in Chicago at the time, and I put in for a three-month leave of absence, and my, my employer quickly denied me that three-month leave of absence and accused me of having a Peter Pan complex, which I apparently still have, and, um, <laughs> and um, quickly, uh, quickly denied me the leave of absence, so I did the only irresponsible thing I could. I quit, and my brother and I took off. And we climbed the highest mountain in Papua New Guinea, which is um, Mount Wilhelm, 16,100 feet. And we canoed the length of something called the Sepik River, which is New Guinea's kind of heart of darkness river. And um, in, these, in these almost unmanageable dugouts um, that we bought at the, at the headwaters of the river. And we canoed down river, and up on the upper Sepik, people had, had never, never seen outsiders before. So we would we would we would stop in these villages at night where they have these huge kind of diax style longhouses and uh, you know a hundred extended families would live in there sometimes fifty to hundred people would live in one one house and we tie off our canoe and we'd walk into these villages and we'd be surrounded by a hundred people and they'd have machetes and nine foot long pig spears and we'd be terrified because of course we'd heard the stories about New Guinea cannibals and head hunters. And they would be, ter turns out they were terrified too. And um, it, it was amazing because it was all the, always the kids who broke the ice. The kids would come dashing out of the crowd of people and they'd come run up to us and they'd touch our skin or our hair. I had more hair back then. And, um, and um, the next thing, the next thing we'd, we'd smile and they'd smile and the next thing we knew we were their honored guests and they were killing a chicken on our behalf or a pig on our behalf and we were, they, they were drumming all night long and we were dancing all night, all, all night long. Anyway, it was one of the most remarkable, remarkable experiences of my life and I vowed then that I was gonna return as much as I could before I died. And um, so in 1995, my wife and I were living in, I was living in Colorado, I got married, my wife and I sold everything we had and took off on a year and a half backpacking trip through the South Pacific and Southeast Asia. And um, one of the places we went was New Guinea. I said, New Guinea is one of the world's last great wildernesses. I'd like you to see it before it's gone. So we hiked all over New Guinea. We canoed. We had an amazing time. But she came down with malaria. I'd never seen malaria before, but I knew the symptoms. She, her fever was 104 degrees, and she could not pick her head up off her chest. And um, I had, we were in this little village at the time, and I had to hike out of this little village to this boom town and find the only phone in town at the bank, and I had to call her parents. 
and tell her that not only had this madman married their daughter, but he dragged her to New Guinea and she, she had malaria. And they were none too pleased, needless to say, but I'm, I'm convinced that had my wife made that call, they would have quickly told her to have the marriage annulled and get away from get away from that guy as quickly as she possibly could. Well, fortunately, she stuck it out, and today we have three daughters, and whom we hope to take to New Guinea one day um, when they're a bit older. But um, the the only reason I tell that story is because um, in 1989, when I first went to New Guinea, I had no idea that there had been a land war on the island of New Guinea, like most people in the United States. In 1995, I realized that this land war had been fought by men like your grandfather, men from the 32nd Infantry Division, and I realized that the men I'd grown up around, you know, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, the men that marched in the parades on 4th of July and Memorial Day and Veterans Day were men in all likelihood that had probably fought here. And I thought, my God, if, 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 other, if I don't know this story having grown up here, Certainly people across the country don't know this story, and I, so I slowly began to research the story. At some point I came across an obscure reference to these men who'd made this cruel march over the mountains, and I thought, aha, if I'm ever going to write this book, here's my way into the story, because the battle is just too big to tell in its entirety, so here's my narrative thread. So when my beer book didn't get off the ground in 2004, and I just, my wife said, well, you, you know, you've been obsessed with New Guinea ever since I've known you. You've got to write a book about New Guinea. I don't know what book it might be, but you've got to write about New Guinea. And I realized that this was a book I had, to, I had to write. So I started interviewing veterans. In fact, your grandfather was one of the first men I interviewed. Um, and they referred me to friends across the United States. I attended their reunions. And then at some point I realized that if I were going to do an authentic job. If I were going to write the story, I had to try and retrace the route across New Guinea. So I made a trip in 2005, a scouting trip for five weeks, and was told essentially what they told MacArthur not to attempt the trip. But by that time, I was in so deep I couldn't get out. Um, I came home, I started assembling the team, gathering our supplies. I tried to find a documentary film crew. In fact, um, contacted a number of documentary film crews across the country. A number of them were quite interested, and I said, but there's a catch, and the catch is we're going to walk across New Guinea. Well, <laughs> their, their enthusiasm quickly diminished, and then at some point I realized that nobody was going to accompany us, so we started this documentary film company. Um, I, I began, tra I trained for the trip for a year. Um, I live in the hill country of Wisconsin along, along the Wisconsin River, so there are lots of hills. There's also a big swamp. Four days a week I used to walk through the swamp in t-shirt and shorts and diving booties for, uh, for three or four hours a day. And then two or two days a week uh, I would go to the big hill outside our town. I'd, take a, I'd put on an 80-pound pack and I'd take my daughter, I'd put her in the wheelbarrow. And I'd put a blanket down on the wheelbarrow. She'd put listen to books on tape, Harry Potter, and I'd push her up and down this hill. She was my accomplice. She was my training partner. And amazingly, she has fond memories of this time. She's like, Daddy, will you push me in the wheelbarrow some more, you know? And so we'd walk up and down this hill for three or four hours to train. But the, the, as hard as I trained, as hard as we all train, there is absolutely nothing that could have prepared us for just how difficult this was. Nothing, I, I, I trained harder for this trip than I did for the Arctic. Um, we, New Guinea, as I said, is just, is the most difficult place I've ever been. We'd get to the top of these mountains, we'd climb to the top of these mountains, and we'd do it on all fours. They have no, these, they, these trails don't abide by national park standards. There are no switchbacks. They just go straight up and straight down, and we'd be on our hands and knees. Eventually, I had to give up my pack because I tore that ACL and I couldn't, I could barely walk. We'd be on our hands and knees, just clawing our way up through the mud, grabbing vines, grabbing trees, grabbing roots. And there are leeches and red ants all over these trails, so you have leeches all over you. And I mean, it's absolutely miserable. And then we'd get to the top and we'd think, hallelujah, we're, we're at the top. And then we'd, we'd walk for 50 feet. And then we'd have to go down, and I'd stand at the top of that mountain, and I'd think, there's absolutely no way we're going to get this down this mountain without losing our lives. And I thought, you know, this is just stupid. We have, I have too much to lose. I have a wife and three daughters, and I thought, this, this, this is just crazy. 
and but ultimately ultimately we kept going but the I guess the point I'm trying to make is I, I'm no way comparing what we did with what the soldiers did we had absolutely everything working in our favor and it was still the hardest thing I've ever done in my life we had modern gear we had we had uh, modern food we had anti-malarial stuff we had a satellite phone we had GPS um, the, uh, the, we had 1975 Australian map, the most recent map, which still had big white spaces in the mountains, so they weren't of much help. But um, we, we had everything working in our favor, and we almost didn't make it. They had everything working against them. Um, I tore my ACL. Three of the guys on our team got malaria. One of them we had to ship out two days early before we reached the north coast because the leech bites had turned into big festering infections and he started getting red lines shooting up his legs. He had septicemia, so we had, to, we had to get him out of there. We flew him on a mission plane back to Port Moresby, and the doctors there told him that had he arrived a day or two later, they would have to take off his leg. So it was, it was really, really grueling, um, but we eventually made it to the North Coast, and when we did, we went back to this provincial town. We got to drink beer, we got to celebrate, we got to sleep under clean sheets, these guys who did it march straight into battle, and yeah. you know that of, that of course makes makes all the difference. So that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll attempt to answer them. How, how long did your trip take? Um, Nineteen days. But what we what we were doing is we were walking. It was an enjoyable trip. We were walking 10, 12. 10, 12 hours a day. We'd get up at 4 in the morning, we'd break camp, break jungle camp, and we'd get going before sunup, and we'd walk till about 6 o'clock at night because what we, what I discovered was that the, the, guys, the guys who made the march in 1942, they were moving more slowly, of course. They were moving 1,100 soldiers across the mountains, and because they were moving more slowly, when they got malaria, they got it at the toughest part of the trip. They got it in the mountains. And we wanted to be out of the mountains as close to the north coast as we could be by the time we got malaria because we knew people were going to come down with it. So we, we hustled through as fast as we possibly could. But I'm leading another group back there in, well, two, fall of 2008 or 2009, and we're going to try and do it in, um, in about 28 days, so essentially a month. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it almost broke us all. So When I got back, I, I was sick for three months. They didn't know what I had. They gave me malaria smears. They couldn't figure it out. They diagnosed me with something with, that they diagnosed soldiers with in World War II, fever of unknown origin. But I had body aches. I, 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 um, I was weak. I had fevers. I, you know, so they, they eventually, they eventually uh, disappeared. But, so I don't know. I have no idea what I had. <laughs> I hope it doesn't come back to haunt me at some point. <laughs> Go ahead. In the clip, they mentioned the importance of having dogs with you. What yeah. role do they play, and did the soldiers have canines? That's, that's a good question. Um, no, the soldiers didn't have dogs. We had dogs. They're hunting dogs. They're the, they're the rarest dogs in the world. They're called the singing dogs of New Guinea. and. Um, they have they have the most they have a nose like the wolf they they have the most acute noses of any dog even bloodhounds or beagles of any dog in the world and they use them to, to tree game and then they they come with their spears or slingshots mind you they don't have guns and um, they shoot these animals out of the out of the trees and that's partly what we ate as we walked across as you saw that 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 thing on the spit. Um, it's remarkably good. <laughs> it doesn't look very good, but it is. It is quite good. But without those dogs, we would have had a we would have a tough time. And that's what the people in the mountains of Guinea depend on. Um, they use them to hunt all the time. How, how tough was it to find uh, fresh, clean, non-diseased water on the trip? Uh, not hard at all. Um, in the in the villages, we we filtered our water um, because you know they they bathe in those villages and they also raise pigs. But once, um, once we got a little way out of the villages, we drank right out of the streams, right out of the rivers. So water was not a problem. As you imagine, you're in the jungle, so there's just there's water everywhere. So that, it's the only other place I've ever been besides the Arctic where you can drink directly right out of the streams. 
You had a question. What was the casualty rate? Um, it, it was over 70%. Um, it was, uh, it, they had one of the highest casualty rates of, you know, of any battle in, the, in World War II. And, you know, that's not all people killed or wounded in battle, but in many cases it was malaria or dengue fever. The, the men were not allowed off the front lines until their fevers reached 104 degrees. So um, and they, then they'd go back to the portable hospital, they'd get, they'd get um, quinine, their fever would drop to 101 or 102 degrees and they'd be sent to right, right back into battle. So um, yeah, it was just a, it was a miserable war, a miserable, a miserable place to be. Anything else? Enough. <laughs> it can't get any more. It's a question right? over here. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Just a quick question. In terms of the veterans that you contacted, were all of them willing to talk about their experiences, or did you find some that that didn't want to speak to you about this? Yeah, that's a great. That, that's another great question. Um, we, uh, you you hear about all the reticent World War II veterans who don't don't want to kind of unbury the memory of these uh, of these wars and these guy these men were were initially really really reluctant to in, in in part because they feel that they've been forgotten so it took a lot of, it took a lot of time I made repeated visits um, the first time the second time the third time mostly they tell me funny stories eventually they started telling me the painful stories and as you can imagine that was you know that was as I said initially, profoundly emotional, not only for them, but also for me. Uh, but it was very difficult for them to talk about it. There were a few people who refused to talk about it, but there weren't many. And I think ultimately for those who did talk, it was cathartic. They, I think that many of them wanted to talk, have wanted to talk about it for, for their whole life. And finally, as they near the end of their lives, have given them themselves kind of the emotional freedom to do that. Makes sense. Did you, you know, yeah, is there any resentment towards General Carter? Ah, God. Uh, yeah. Discover? Um, I, I didn't know that much about General MacArthur prior to uh, beginning researching this book, but yeah, in in there was a magazine published in nineteen uh, called Liberty Magazine, an article published in nineteen fifties, and the title of the article was "Why the Why the Thirty Second Division Cannot Forgive General MacArthur." They loathed him. Um, they called him all kinds of names, Dugout Doug. Uh, they thought he was a kind of a, um, you know, a, a, a peacock. He was, you know, America needed a hero at the time, and for some reason, um, um, Douglas MacArthur appointed himself America's hero. But the soldiers who fought under him had nothing good to say about him. There's a great journalist who recently died, David Halberstam, wrote a book called The Coldest Winter. Um, and he has nothing good about the, about Korea. He has nothing good to say about MacArthur either. Um, in fact, I, there was only one one man that I met, an officer, that had even something remotely good to say about General MacArthur. So I kind of took my lead from those guys. But I'm pretty critical of him too. So anything else? All right. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Yeah.